Coast to Coast. The Stephen A. Smith Show starts right now. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio and ESPN News, 250 plus markets across the United States of America. Check your AM FM listing nearest you, plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM Channel 80, plus ESPN Radio simulcast over the live national television airwaves of ESPN News. Number to call up as always is 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Quote, buy and save. On home insurance with Progressive's new home called Explorer. Only at Progressive.com. Time for Straight Talk. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Uh, In approximately eight minutes or so, the one and only Mortimer, Chris Mortensen, NFL insider extraordinaire, will be on with us to talk about some late breaking news developing out of New York City. And of course, um, obviously, uh, Paul Feinbaum, the mouth of the South, Football aficionado, college and pros as far as I'm concerned. He will be on blessing us with his presence at the top of hour number two of to show of today's show. So I am definitely looking forward to that. We all know where it's time to go. We all know what it's time to talk about. The New York Giants have finally decided to get their acts together. It has been announced that Daniel Jones... Quarterback out of Duke, the number six overall pick in this past April's NFL draft is the new starting quarterback for the New York Giants. Eli Manning, 232 career starts since 2004 NFL record. It has come to an end. It's not consecutive starts because Bob McAdoo, the chubby Pat Riley wannabe who decided to bench Eli Manning a couple of years ago, ended up losing his job along with the GM. That's not going to be the case for Pat Shermer. Here's the situation. Daniel Jones has been named the starter for Sunday's game at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Since 2017, Eli Manning, third worst QBR, fifth Fewest yards per attempt, minimum 500 pass attempts. Eli Manning is not what he used to be. I know there's a lot of people that might question this. I have no problem with this move by Dave Gettleman, by Pat Shermer, by by John Mara, by Mr. Tish, by the Giants organization. It is absolutely positively the right move to make. And here's a couple of reasons, a few reasons as to why that is. New York Giants are 0-2 on the year. New York Giants have looked absolutely putrid offensively, even worse defensively, by the way. Ranked 30th in the National Football League in points allowed. Ranked 28th in yards allowed. Ranked 30th in in, in yards allowed uh, over your overall. In passing yards allowed, I'm sorry. 18th against the run. The only thing decent about them is their rushing attack because Saquon Barkley is clearly the best running back in football talent-wise. They're 16 yards accumulated offensively, but 26 in yards and and points that they've scored because they've only scored 17 against Dallas, only 14 against the Buffalo Bills. Both losses, 0-2, got a game against Tampa, then a home game against Washington and Minnesota, then a game at New England on October 10th. The New York Giants stink. They are not a good team. They've got Saquon Barkley and literally nothing else to brag about. But in Daniel Jones, he provides hope. And damn it, 
This organization needs it. And New York Giants fans deserve it. Let me be very clear. The New York Giants have missed the playoffs six times in the last seven years. Over the last two years that they've missed the postseason, their record is 8-24. and 24. Meanwhile, Eli Manning's about 38 years of age. He's clearly not what he used to be. Even now, this year, nearly 63% of his passes completed. In the two games, two touchdowns, two interceptions, got a QBR of 30. Come on, y'all. He can't run. He can't scramble out of the pocket. He goes down at the sight of a rush. I'm not disrespecting Eli Manning. I genuinely like and respect him. And I damn sure appreciate those two Super Bowl championships. But when you miss the playoffs six times in seven years, what the hell do you need? You need a psychic to tell you what the hell is forthcoming? I mean, enough's enough. And Daniel Jones, last time we saw him, I'm not talking about the two minutes at the end of the regular season game against the Dallas Cowboys to open the season, the final two minutes, when the game was well out of hand and it was just garbage time. I'm talking about the last time we saw Daniel Jones was when Daniel Jones showed up against the first team of the new of the Cincinnati Bengals in a preseason game and completed like nine of 11 passes for 141 yards. Daniel Jones balled throughout the preseason. Daniel Jones was picking up the offense throughout the preseason. Daniel Jones is a big target. He's young. He's got a little bit of wheels on him. He can throw the damn football. Do I think he was Dwayne Haskins who threw over who threw 50 touchdowns in one season at Ohio State? And it took Daniel, Daniel Jones three seasons to throw 52 touchdown passes at Duke? No, but it is Duke. And the level of competition he was playing with, not just against, says something. So I'm looking at Daniel Jones, and I'm saying, excuse me, he brings hope. He brings hope. And with the hope that he brings to the equation, based on a giant squad clearly going nowhere with Eli Manning, how many, how many times do you expect Saquon Barkley to get out there on the field and other dudes to get on the field for the New York Giants with absolutely positively no hope whatsoever of making anything happen? Why do that to the team? Why do that? Especially with your offensive line looking better than it's looked in years. Why not take a chance? You got nothing else to lose. And if he looks like garbage and he struggles, so what? Peyton Manning struggled as a rookie. Aaron Rodgers struggled as a rookie. Plenty of quarterbacks throughout NBA history had to take their lumps as rookies. There's no harm. And Daniel Jones taking those licks as long as they're not literal because the offensive line is not protecting him. If he's got to throw interceptions, if he got to make mistakes, if he's got to figure out NFL defenses, et cetera, et cetera, so be it. Kudos, props to the New York Giants for having the courage to finally make this damn move. You spent years giving New York fans a subpar product. And enough's enough. Saquon Barkley's averaging 7.8 yards a carry, y'all. 7.8 yards a carry. This is where teams stacking the line of scrimmage, knowing that the Giants' offense poses absolutely no threat whatsoever with this passing game. What is the problem? What do you expect? Saquon Barkley's a special brother, man. I do, and I will say this. See, here's where it's bad. If you're the New York Giants, it really highlights how you should have never gave away Odell Beckham Jr. It really, really does. Because for the third game of the season, for you to be willing to make this switch, clearly Eli is an issue. We think he's got two, three more years of them. Yeah, holding the clipboard and coaching Daniel Jones. Sure. But to be out on that field, come on now. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if Eli Manning ended up getting traded to someplace like Jacksonville. I wouldn't be surprised if Tom Coughlin tried to bring him there. And why not? Blake Bortles is gone and Nick Foles is out for at least 10 weeks. You got a defense that could potentially be Super Bowl caliber. You're frustrating the hell out of Jalen Ramsey and everybody else because they know your offense stinks. And even though Eli Manning doesn't work in New York any longer, I don't think he would work in Jacksonville either personally. 
But he certainly would probably be a better upgrade than the rookie Minshew that you got, whatever the hell his name is. I'm just saying. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. You're listening live to Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Any minute now, we'll have the great one, Chris Mortensen, on the line with us uh, to highlight some of the particulars involving the New York Giants' decision to put Daniel Jones into the lineup as a starting quarterback for week three against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Actually, I think that's very, very appropriate. Jameis Winston hasn't looked that impressive. Why not go with it? But anyway, we pass promise. Chris Mortensen is on the line with us right now. What's going on, sir? How are you? How's everything? Well, I can tell you're having a better day than yesterday. Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. I am. And, and, and let me Tom get, Jackson and I get concerned about you sometimes listen, when we see that I'm having a very bad day. Let me tell you something right now. I'm giving you a virtual hug here because leave it to my man Chris Mortensen to look out for me and to give me some semblance of good news for crying out loud. Listen, Daniel Jones is the starting quarterback. How did it come to be in week three of this season, uh, Chris? Well, I think number one is that Daniel Jones showed – and you can say proved in quotes because it was only OTAs and, and, and training camp and preseason. He showed Pat Shermer, the coach, that he is ready to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. And, and Shermer has said that frequently. I also think that the Giants' position was, you know, basically as long as we're in contention or a contender, Eli's going to be our starter. Eli is not getting benched because of his play in the first two weeks of the season. He's getting benched because that defense and that team is not a playoff contender. And so, therefore, I think that Shermer feels like, you know, let's get on the, with the business of Daniel Jones. Uh, you know, I'm not sure it's, a, it's the greatest time to put Daniel in there, but he feels he's mentally tough. Uh, and, you know, listen, believe it or not, the Buccaneers' defense with Todd Bowles is pretty good. But, you know, you're talking about a, a team that just played a game without the top two receivers, Sterling Shepard, who had a concussion, mm-hmm. Golden Tate, who's still on suspension, right. uh, Cody Latimer got hurt, and, and, a, and a defense that gives up points like crazy. So I think it's just, you know, listen, I'm not sure it's a great time to throw Daniel Jones in there, but, I, but you know, just talk, from talking to Shermer and the – you know, during the training camp mm-hmm. uh, and also talking to David Cutcliffe. Ironically, but, Eli Manning's offensive coordinator or head coach at, at Ole Miss and, and Daniel Jones, head coach at Duke, he feels like he's very mature and able to withstand tough times. And tough times are ahead. Well, Mort, I got to ask you this, though. I hear what you're saying about Eli Manning, but you see the numbers. Since 2017, third worst QBR, fifth fewest yards per attempt. Uh, we right. know. I mean, the, the man can't scramble. He goes down at the sight of a rush for crying out loud. He's clearly not what he used to be, and the Giants have missed the playoffs six times in the last seven years. I understand what you're saying about the first two games of this season, and that definitely can't be disputed. But there is no doubt that there's been a dissipated level of skill exhibited by Eli Manning and that people have been clamoring for a change for a long time. Why isn't it just cool to say, you know what? It's time to move in a different direction. The Eli er- Manning era needs to come to an end in New York. Well, I mean, listen, I- I've heard those voices, and I-, I think that you have numbers and maybe your eyes to- will support that. By the way, self-survival by quarterbacks has been adopted by many veteran quarterbacks along the way. Mm-hmm. And-, and you can't tell Carson Wentz, not to be slack going head first or whatever. Uh, when you when where Peyton Manning and Tom Brady are smart enough to get down and not get hit. Now Daniel Jones does bring a certain level of athleticism. I had somebody tell me watching him in training camp that it's it's kind of like watching Josh Allen in Buffalo play. You didn't you don't realize how athletic he is until you see it in person. But let's go back and look at the last eight or nine drafts and personnel decisions by the Giants. Mm-hmm. And if we forget, this is a team game. And if if your if if your team if you're not if you're getting hit if your receivers aren't in the right spot at the right time and I still believe that uh, there's there's a lot of aspects here I think Eli went into this season in the best shape of his life his arm was live I went to the Manning camp you know Trevor Lawrence and Justin Herbert all these young shot quarterbacks Eli out threw them all but it is a game that's played uh, amongst team. And I personally think that it's been a bad team. I think they've done a bad job in personnel for a while. And we're seeing the, we're seeing the fruits and really the rotten fruits of what they did or didn't do 
uh, in the last seven or eight years uh, through the draft. Chris Morrison right here with Stephen A., ESPN Radio, ESPN News. If anybody would know more, it would be you. What exactly have the players been saying to Pat Shermer, to Dave Gettleman, about Daniel Jones and his need to be in the lineup? Because we know throughout history, sometimes a coach is forced to make these decisions because you have personnel on your roster that's clamoring for a guy because they believe he's got the goods. Is that what transpired here as it pertains to Eli no, Manning? Steve, Steve to a, I, I think it's, I think it's a, uh, uh, an erroneous jump uh, with all due respect to, no. to, to suggest that players would go to the head coach or general manager and say, we got to get Daniel Jones in there. Okay. I will say this. They certainly sense the excitement from players and from coaches and the front office with what they have seen from Daniel Jones. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've had no indication in talking to people there that this is something that the players are saying, let's get Daniel in there. Let's get Daniel in there. No, I think it's, I, I really think Daniel's earned this uh, on his own merits and the combination that the fact that this, this Giants team is not very good. And I think I have read and, and heard people say, you know, let's not waste Saquon Barkley's uh, good years, you know, like, like Detroit did with Barry Sanders. There may be some level of truth to that. Mm-hmm. But right now, the Giants' problem is not Eli Manning. The Giants' problem is that defense and having – Really, a, a battered group of receivers. Well, I, I clearly, I appreciate, I appreciate it because I clearly wasn't trying to suggest that the players actually did that. I was asking because I said if anybody would know whether that had occurred, it would be you. I'm talking to Chris Mortensen right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. That's all I was asking. So, having said all of that, where does that leave Eli Manning now? Is he the guy that's going to wait to get back in? Is he the guy that's going to carry a clipboard and be an extension of the coach, or could it be possible that he? he'd be looking to be moved, to be traded because he believes that he still has a few years left in this, in, 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 you know, left in his career. I haven't had that direct conversation with Eli, uh, but I, you know, my, here's what I, I believe about Eli is that, you know, he and his wife, Abby have four children. They're all under eight years old. They really love where they live there in New Jersey. They're established in school. Mm-hmm. He loves being a New York giant. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, he saw his, uh, you know, yes, Peyton, because of injury, ended up playing and resurrecting his career despite incredible obstacles physically in Denver. I don't, they're not the same guys. But one thing you have to remember is that Peyton in his last year was hurt in Denver. And who came in? Brock Osweiler replaced him. And their intent there was that Osweiler was going to finish that year as a starter and Peyton would finish on the bench. But by you know, rehabbing and holding the clipboard and being in that quarterback meeting room and making sure they were ready to play and holding other players around them accountable, making sure they were doing the right thing. What happened? You know the answer to it. Yeah. They went back to Peyton near the end of that season, and they end up winning the Super Bowl, even if he wasn't the sensational Peyton. I think that Eli wants to remain a giant. I think that he – I know he has a no-trade clause – it doesn't make sense right now. Other teams, their situations don't match up, and 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 you have a salary cap situation where some of these teams, like the Jaguars with Nick Foles and Drew Brees and Saints, those guys, those quarterbacks are coming back and they're making a lot of money. Forgive me if this is a silly question, but did the Giants make this move with the idea that Daniel Jones is our starting quarterback from here on out, or did they make this move to say, okay, let's see what they, let's see what he's got, and we always have Eli to fall back to. Uh, they made the movie that Daniel Jones is our starting quarterback, and we're going forward. And 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 that, that's really what, what what this is. There's, there's nothing there's nothing more than that. And I think when Pat Shermer said what he said yesterday at the uh, press conference, you knew then that they, you don't say that unless you're moving to Daniel Jones. And they, I think they've determined that uh, they're not a playoff team. Last question for you. John Mara was on the record uh, a few months ago saying that he had hoped to not see Daniel Jones this season at all because that would mean Eli Manning was having a great season and that's what he was anticipating, not to see Daniel Jones at all. Uh, is this a Pat Shermer, uh, Pat Shermer and Dave Gettleman decision? Or, or It seems obvious that they would talk to ownership about this simply because it's Eli Manning. Is that fair to yeah, assume? Yeah. 
I think you're you're right on all marks. I mean, listen, like I said, the the best hope for the franchise, I think it was John Mara was saying when he said it was, we hope we're in contention and we don't have to go to Daniel Jones. What did Dave Gettleman say at the combine before the draft when it was clear they were going to draft the quarterback? And they, he said, I prefer the the Kansas City model, meaning Patrick Mahomes. You sit all year behind Alex Smith, and then you'll – take over the job. I, so that, to me, was their, always their intent, but this roster was not good enough to carry that out. Chris Mortensen, appreciate it. Great work as always, buddy. Thanks so much for calling me, man. Really appreciate it. All right, it. Stephen A. Love you. Talk take to you it, later. Sammy, love you too. The one and only Chris Mortensen right here with Stephen A. One of the great ones to have ever do uh, be an inside on the NFL in this business. Make no mistake about it. 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. You are listening live. To the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. By the way, we'll get to your calls and more in just a minute. Don't touch that dial. Just getting this party started. By the way, did you know overall job satisfaction is at its highest level in 15 years? Wow. 51%. Wait, what? That's barely half. Would you see a doctor with a 51% patient satisfaction? Please, you know. Sam, Sam Donald's got mononucleosis. Ladies and gentlemen, folks joked around and talked about, you know, that's the kissing disease or whatever. Y'all have any idea how serious that is? It's not a laughing matter. Kidneys and liver supposedly get enlarged. There are people, if I'm correct, who have died from mononucleosis. This is not a joke. On this show, we wish nothing but the best for Sam Donald. A speedy recovery, 100% health, so he can get on the field and remind us what a quarterback that he is. So I can understand if you're the New York Jets, knowing and anticipating that eventually he'll be back this season, why you might not want Colin Kaepernick in your stable. But if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers, what excuse is there? Ben Roethlisberger is gone for the year. Are you really going to sit there with a straight face and tell me that Mason Rudolph is your answer? Oh, by the way, are you going to tell me after watching Lamar Jackson run for over 100 yards and pass for over 250 yards that it doesn't give you some kind of indication of what Colin Kaepernick might potentially be capable of doing for you, even though he's been out of the game for a few years? Does he not deserve a tryout? I'd say he does. I wouldn't mind seeing Colin Kaepernick with a tryout. Mistakes notwithstanding, no matter what you believe, I'm going to repeat, man didn't break no laws. Man didn't even break NFL bylaws. What's wrong with giving him a look? See, if you can't give him a look under these situations, then it is official that he has been blackballed. It is official. There ain't no reason to not give him a look. You can at least give the man a look. Give him a tryout. See what he's got. Now, in defense of those teams, I will say this. Colin Kaepernick, you want a job in the National Football League? Going on Twitter, showing video of you throwing passes to Odell Beckham Jr. Don't get you an NFL job. Your agent needs to be down, and I'm not saying the agent is not doing this, but the agent needs to be out there pounding the pavement and convincing the team to give you a look. will have surgery this week and is out for the season. Roethlisberger injured his elbow in yesterday's loss to Seattle. He had the MRI. It shows the torn ligament, and so he has to have that surgery. I knew they weren't going to win the Super Bowl, but I still thought that they had a playoff run in them. That's all. This isn't a team I look to to make the playoff. This isn't a team I look to to make a run. What they're doing now is seeing what pieces they have for the future and building for something new. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. You must be. Next segment, go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith Podcast. Brought to you by the Capital One Quicksilver Card. Earning unlimited 1.5% cash back on every purchase everywhere. Hey, hey, what's in your wallet? Also, baseball season is heating up. Tune in tonight as Paul Goldsmith and the Cardinals host the Washington Nationals. Presented by Scott's. Coverage begins at 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and 
the ESPN app. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Before I get to the phones, and Paul Feinbaum comes on to start off hour number two. First of all, let me extend a, a, a sincere, gra- a, a, a gracious thank you to the great one himself, Chris Mortensen. Um, he uh, took time out of his busy schedule to come on the show with us because uh, he had been reporting on the whole Daniel Jones situation because Eli Manning was being benched in favor of Daniel Jones. That's number one. Number two, it's just great to see uh, Chris Mortensen back with us. A uh, little sabbatical going on, battling cancer, obviously, and um, appears to be winning that battle at this particular moment in time after being gone and up until several months ago. Um, he's just great at what he does and uh, always incredibly and, and exceptionally good to me. And um, I love the guy. I love him dearly. And so uh, it's really, really good to see him back on his grind. Sunday NFL Countdown. NFL Live probably today doing some sports center work as well. It's just really, really great to see him back in the grind. And also I want to take an opportunity. I had uh, uh, Ed Werder uh, on the show with us a couple of weeks ago. He was gone from ESPN for a little while. He's back. Um, I don't, you know, him and Tom Jackson with Chris Berman doing primetime on the ESPN Plus app and stuff like that. Ladies and gentlemen, to put it in perspective, people like that, helped build ESPN into what it is today. And even though I've been around since 2003, um, I'm relatively new blood compared to those guys uh, that, that did it. It's not just about respecting your elders. Their contacts, their insight, their wisdom, the information that they espouse and disseminate to millions upon millions of people. Um, there's a standard. And to be quite honest with you, there have been times in the history of ESPN where younger younger bloods like myself and others didn't live up to the standard that these guys set. And so it's just great to see them because seeing them around, doing what they do, doesn't just remind you about what ESPN once was. It reminds you about who we are and who we're supposed to be. And so it's an honor to call them my colleagues and friends and to watch them doing what they do. I blushed when Chris Mortensen brought up my man, Tom Jackson. I love that man. Missed him when he was gone and incredibly ecstatic that he's back. While I'm paying tribute to those who are here still with us, let me give a slight tribute to those who are gone from us. Guys like the great John Saunders, who passed away, who was a mentor and a friend. The great Stuart Scott, who was a mentor and a friend. Gone, but never forgotten. Just felt the need to say that at this particular moment in time. Just really, really had to say that, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, I talked about and started off the show talking about Daniel Jones. But the quarterback story is really becoming a very, very compelling one. News just came down to Trevor Simeon is out for the season. The injury that he sustained in Monday Night Football last night to his ankle, he ain't coming back from that this year. He's out. Um, Sam Donald is out indefinitely with mono, mononucleosis to be specific. You got Cam Newton who's got foot injuries. He's questionable for this Sunday's game. Um, So with all those things going on, along with Big Ben Roethlisberger being out for the year. It was announced yesterday. Very, very simple question. How come nobody's calling Colin Kaepernick? You trying to tell me the Jets don't need Colin Kaepernick? Some dude named Luke Falk is starting for the New York Jets Sunday. Didn't have a bad game last night, so I'm not about to cast any aspersions on them, but are you kidding me? Colin Kaepernick can't get a call? Not a call? Mike Tomlin adroitly avoided the issue of Colin Kaepernick when asked by the media because he said, I'm not talking about anybody that's not on this roster. Steelers are not interested in Colin Kaepernick from what I've been told. New Orleans Saints, with Drew Brees out for the next several weeks due to his thumb injury, haven't even returned calls to Colin Kaepernick's agent. The New York Jets, we don't know where their interest lies. At some point in time, regardless of what we want to say, 
how Colin Kaepernick could have elected to handle things in the aftermath of kneeling. Two things are undeniable. A, he broke no laws legally. And B, he violated no bylaws by the National Football League. We could add C, that the president himself said he wouldn't mind seeing Colin Kaepernick play. So there's no longer that that to be concerned about with the owners. So what's the problem? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying that Colin Kaepernick should be granted a roster spot and automatically a starting or a backup quarterback. That's not what I'm claiming here. What I'm claiming, ladies and gentlemen, he don't deserve a tryout. I spoke again to his lady, Nessa Diab. Say what you will about her. Very beautiful lady, inside and out, it seems. Very, very nice to me. Class personified. She says he's waking up 5 a.m. every day, five days a week. Training for hours upon hours every day, and he's been doing that for the last two years. So if he gets the call, he's immediately ready. That's what she says. Took a knee, addressing racial oppression, racial inequality, brutality on the part of police officers. He did all of that. Again, I might have issues with the execution thereafter. I certainly might have issues with the fact that so many people are speaking for him and he's not speaking enough for himself. These days, I don't think he should be as quiet as he has been. But I think the other side to this is there's no justification for doing this to him. Not at this point. My man Carlton in Tampa pointed out, you know, some of the things that took place that would lead to him not getting the job, the Fidel Gastro t-shirt, the, the stuff on Twitter comparing him, uh, Ray Lewis and, and Steve Bashotti, the owner for the Ravens and the, and the former star player for the Ravens, to Samuel O. Jackson and Leonardo DiCaprio's characters in Django. Wearing pigs on socks and stuff like that. Yeah, all of that's going to be counted against him. All that's true. All that's true. But I do think it's safe to say that the NFL has forgiven people for far more egregious and harmful acts. You might have found what Colin Kaepernick or anybody associated with him did as distasteful from time to time. But that's about the worst you can say. Criminals have been allowed back in the National Football League. Straight up criminals. You can't give this man a tryout? I was told by an official in the NFL Colin Kaepernick ain't going to get a job throwing passes to Odell Beckham Jr. on Twitter. Your agent's got to pound the pavement. He got to get himself, he's got to get himself into a football camp or to somebody's practice. That brings me to the agent. Because, see, when I think about things, and I got to tell you this, for me personally, If the agent is contacting teams and the agent is not getting his phone calls returned, we got a problem here. His agent has reportedly reached out to several teams. There's no doubt about that. Carolina Panthers, New Orleans Saints, New York Jets, Pittsburgh Steelers could all be looking to add quarterbacks. We all know that. But if the agent is not getting his phone calls returned, maybe the problem is with Kaepernick's representation. I'm not advocating fire the man or whatever. The man, uh, loyalty matters. Stood by your side. Did it desert you? I get all of that. But there's something wrong when an agent can't even get his phone calls returned. I suspect some of the more elite or powerful agents in the National Football League will get their phone calls returned. I think it's worth consideration. And I also think the other thing to point out is that there's millions upon millions of people that want to support Colin Kaepernick. So the threat of Colin Kaepernick costing you money and influencing your bottom line in a negative fashion, that argument no longer appears to be palpable. 
So these are all things that I think need to be thought about and need to be considered. 888-SAY-ESPN, that's 888-729-3776. Lewis, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. I was calling, I was just concerned about, as I was calling, I was concerned about what you were talking about as far as calling governor. Uh, I think there still is needing. Uh, uh, I don't think Tom, Tom should be trying to get rid of anybody that has any potential talent to give to the still they can use all the time they can have right now. And I want to know, what do you think th- further on that? I don't understand what you just said. About Colin Kaepernick. Okay. I think the Steelers can use him. Yes. I think Tom, Tomlin is crazy to even think about dismissing anybody else that has talent to help us. Well, I definitely, I, I, definitely think, I definitely think he should be given a look. And I'll tell you something right now. To me, the Steelers have an opportunity to make the greatest argument. Because guess what? When it comes to the Pittsburgh Steelers, think about the Rooney Rule. Who is it named after? It's named after Dan Rooney, the former owner for the Pittsburgh Steelers who passed away in 2017. This is a man responsible for more minority head coaches, more minorities in front office positions, you know, mandating that at least a minority candidate get interviewed via the Rooney rule. Now, there clearly needs to be modifications to that, and there needs to be improvements in that. No question about it. But the man's heart was in the right place, and he was a trailblazer in that regard. And I think the Steelers could continue in that mode by bringing somebody like Colin Kaepernick on board. That's my personal opinion. But the Jets, now that Trevor Simeon is out, and 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 you don't have any idea when Sam Donald is expected to be back. What would be wrong with bringing Colin Kaepernick on for a tryout? Colin Kaepernick, Cam, uh, uh, Cam News got a foot injury, and we don't know how good that shoulder is either. What's wrong with him being coming in for a trial with the Panthers? What's wrong with the Saints coming in for a trial when we don't know how long Drew Brees is going to be going? All of these things are things that I, I think I think are things that 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 should be broached. Yeah, somebody, anybody. I got you. Appreciate the call. Eight 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 say ESPN. It's eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. Look, there are those with reservations. There are those who believe. I had players text me this morning saying that the moment Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed settled their grievance, all right, with the National Football League, and Colin Kaepernick wasn't specific about what the settlement entailed, um, they thought he would never be in the league again. I don't know why they thought that, other than him being blackballed, but that was what I was told. Nevertheless, what cannot be denied, what cannot be disputed or argued, is the fact that with all of these quarterback issues, these multitude of teams have, there's no excuse for not bringing in the man for a workout to see if he still got something for you. No excuse. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Back with your calls before Paul Feinbaum comes on in a minute. Your radio. white producers to look at me when I'm saying this because as black folks, as minorities in this country, we need to address something that's very, very important. I think I've been working with Jonathan Winthrop for a long time. I've gotten to know my man, JC for many years and other producers here and what have you. And Folks that work within this country, you got some black folks here, you got some white folks here. I don't believe that you're a bad person because you disagree with me. Oh, by the way, let me take it a step further. I would totally understand if they don't. I would totally understand if they can't relate to my black experience. You know why? Because they're not black. This notion that everybody has to understand where we come from, without being us, to me, is ill-informed. I said the same thing to y'all about the Kaepernick situation. I said the same thing to y'all about Jerry Jones when he was taking a position on the knee and all of this other stuff, and everybody was going to, I said, excuse me, I don't expect a white billionaire 
to have the same sensitivities, culturally or otherwise, than impoverished people from the minority community. That's not them. It's not who they are. Our objective should be identifying what our goals, what our agenda is, and going about the business of convincing them that it's in the best interest of their agendas to facilitate progress when it comes to us. Period. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News, being brought to you live from above the Heineken River Deck at Pier 17. Also, prep your engine for winter with Pennzoil Synthetic Motor Oil. The first motor oil made from natural gas, not crude oil. The proof is in the Pennzoil. You know, John... You know, JC, I mean, it's interesting. I, you know, sometimes, sometimes, occasionally I go on a blogosphere. You heard, you heard this thing for the win. You know, uh, Stephen a had another really bad mistake. So, in other words, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Dallas Cowboys yesterday, right? And I'm talking about how Kellen Moore replaced Chan Gailey. Okay? Now, I understand Scott Linehan was his predecessor. Okay? So, John, JC... I've been saying Scott Linehan for six months, okay? <laughs> and Scott Linehan, Scott Linehan, Scott Linehan. And for some reason, I was thinking about Chan Gailey yesterday. And because I said Chan Gailey before a producer was kind enough to remind me, I meant Scott Linehan, who I talk about damn near every day because obviously I hate on the Cowboys, right? Suddenly, I don't know who to form offensive coordinator with the Cowboys. Are. So in other words, I'm talking for six months. I'm talking about six months. All right? Six months. Been talking about Scott Linden and Scott Linden and him and Jason Garrett and blah, blah, blah. And now Kellen Moore takes over. All right? Then I'm talking about Scott Linehan gone. Kellen Moore taking over. Run attack to a pass happy offensive coordinator. How that could affect Dak Prescott. I'm talking about this stuff for months. Months. And because one day I mentioned Chan Gailey instead of Scott Linehan who's been gone from Chan Gilly, who's been gone from the Dallas Cowboys for years. Suddenly, everything that I've been saying every day for months goes out the window, and now I don't know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the blockosphere. This is what I mean by bloggers. Not all, but this is what I'm talking about. So Jonathan, uh, so, so Jonathan, I, I, I've been talking about, I've been talking about you for you. You're my producer, Jonathan. But I, I, I say Nuno instead of Jonathan one day, and now suddenly I don't know who my own producer is because I, 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 I messed up your name because I got a thousand other things going on. That's what's on my mind. And they'll try to write a blog is filled with the lead. Stephen A made a mistake. I guess I really am a star, huh? I guess I am. Mention me. You'll get more clips. Album number two up next. From coast to coast. The Stephen A. Smith Show starts right now. Airwaves of ESPN Radio and ESPN News. 250 plus markets across the United States of America. Check your AM FM listing nearest you plus ESPN Radio and Sirius XM. Channel 80 plus ESPN Radio simulcast over the live national television airwaves of ESPN News. Number to call up as always is 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. A reminder that Golik and Wingo will be live. From New York City this Friday, covering the Jets-Patriots matchup. Part of ESPN Radio's Fall Football Tour. Brought to you by Marathon. Get five cents off every gallon, every day, with Make It Count rewards from Marathon. To sign up, visit makeitcount.com or download the free app. It is always my honor and privilege to have my next guest on the line. 
Some people call him the mouth of the South, obviously incredibly knowledgeable about the sport of college football as far as I'm concerned. He is an authority on the sport of football. He has a fantastic radio show as well every weekday. He is the great one himself, my buddy, the one and only Paul Feinbaum, sitting right next to me. What's going on, man? How you doing? It is a pleasure to see you. Well, first things first, because you you reside in Charlotte, is that correct? That is correct. And that's where you're usually doing your show, correct? Yeah, but what... during this football season every week, you're up in New York, right? I'm up here a couple of days a week. Now, how do you like the flavor of New York City after being down south? Now, now listen, not to tell my life story, but— Right. Uh, I know you're from here. I, I'm, I'm a southerner, but everyone else is from New York. My mom, my dad, my right. sister. I, I'm a, they, they had me in the south. Got you. But, uh, yeah, I, I love being here. Okay. I'm and, just and, checking. And, I'm just until, checking. until it gets cold. Well, see, that's for you. No one out of here. See, everybody teased me about L.A., but they don't realize it's a plot. It's really, I really love L.A., from November through April oh, yeah. and May. Now, see, June and, and not no, July, August, no. September, I don't mind being in New York, but I am sick of cold weather, Paul Feinbaum. I'm over it, man. Yeah, no, I I was in uh, I was in L.A. Uh, mid-August, and I was sweltering. Right. It, it's, it's oppressive out there. That's right. That's right. But let's, this is great. Th- this is, man. It's good to see you. Let's get, let's get to a lot of uh, uh, football stuff that we want to get into. And I know most of the time you come on the show, we're talking college football, but we're going to mix it up a little bit with sure. some NFL stuff because a lot of these guys you know very, very well. For example, uh, the New York Giants just <laughs> announced that Daniel Jones is going to be their starting quarterback. Eli Manning will be benched. 232 starts uh, since 2004. The most of any quarterback in National Football League, et cetera. But they're going in a different direction. They're going with Daniel Jones out of Duke. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, who would have thought Daniel Jones would be getting more attention right now than, than Zion Williamson? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, it, I, I'm really glad to see it. Uh, I, I mean, come on. Eli probably should have been uh, replaced two years ago. Right. Uh, this His career has cratered. Uh, say whatever you want. He'll get a lot of great send-offs, but uh, it's over. And sometimes you just have to accept it. Uh, Daniel Jones was not a player that uh, I was really locked into until the end of the last season. You saw him mm-hmm. once or two. But look, Stephen, mm-hmm. who's watching Duke? Okay, right. I mean, so I, let me let me let me turn off Ohio State, Michigan, so I can watch Duke <laughs> and Wake Forest. There we go. That's what I'm saying. Which is hard, why it's kind of hard for most of us to imagine, at least back when the draft took place, that the Giants had passed up on Haskins, Wade Haskins, out of Ohio State, who threw 50 touchdowns in one season last year, in favor of Daniel Jones. Out of Duke. I mean, what, did you see something that no. Dave Gettleman saw that most of us didn't see? I wear glasses, so that means I don't see anything that Dave Gettleman sees. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got you. He, I got doesn't, you. he doesn't see. Right. Um, here, here's the thing I do like about him, and and I'm, I'm broad generalizing here, but I'm very familiar with David Cutcliffe. Uh, David Cutcliffe was at Tennessee. He coached Heath Schuler there, who didn't turn out to be a great pro player, but he was a great college player, obviously Peyton Manning. Uh, and, and then he was the head coach at Ole Miss and got Eli Manning. So he, he is a quarterback whisperer of many degrees. Now, just because Daniel Jones played for him doesn't mean he's going to be great in New York. I, I'm still not sure he will be. But I, I don't mind the decision because at, at what point were you – I mean, I mean, Eli Manning, it was getting sad. It was really getting pathetic to watch. What When you talk to college coaches, as I know you have for decades, what do they tell you as it pertains to the importance of the, or the significance, rather, of a quote, coach? For example, let's use David Cutcliffe as an example. You coached at Tennessee and you coached Peyton Manning. You was an offensive coordinator, Ole Miss, and now here you are at Duke University and you're the – quarterback whisperer, but you're the head coach at Duke University, you coach Daniel Jones. How much does that really, really mean in the grand scheme of things? I think in college it means a lot. Uh, and, and those who don't get good coaching uh, struggle. L- look at Jalen Hurts, for example. Uh, he played for Lane Kiffin. He was great. He, he would look over, and the nonverbal communication with Lane Kiffin got him going. And, but then he went through a collection of offensive coordinators, and he regressed. Obviously, he went out to Oklahoma because of Lincoln Riley. I mean, everyone knows Lincoln Riley's resume. Mm-hmm. It's not manufactured that, that he turned Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray, two guys that, that left other programs because they couldn't cut it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, Baker Mayfield was at Tech. Kyler Murray was at Texas A&M. And they found a home at Oklahoma because of Lincoln Riley. And I think the same is going to be true. Or it is true. Of Jalen Hurts. Mm. Let's transition because you brought up Kyler Murray. 
How excited are you to see him and what he has done thus far with Kingsbury? How excited are you to see what you've seen from Lamar Jackson just a couple of years removed from Louisville? I don't want to ever make fun of the way someone looks because of the way I look. But, <laughs> but I've tried to watch Kyler. I can't find him on the, on the, on the field. He's so right. small. Right. Uh, I mean, and that 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 sounds like we're, we're talking before the draft, but I, I just don't like that. I mean, I want a quarterback that can see. And, I mean, I think it's, it's been sporadic. Uh, a couple of games in, I'm, I'm not impressed. Mm, not impressed with Kyler Murray. What about Lamar Jackson? Oh my goodness! Uh, I mean, I, I, and, and Stephen, I, I'm 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 really gratified because this is a, a nice kid. I got to know a little bit at Louisville that nobody gave a chance. And I, and I'll, I'll tell you the truth: last pick in the first round. I voted for him uh, for the Heisman because of what I'd seen early in the year, and then I covered the national championship game, and Deshaun Watson went off on Alabama, and I I, I felt like I needed to. to Tell Deshaun Watson I was sorry because I really would have never voted for uh, for, for for Lamar until then. And I think a lot of people felt that way. But, yeah, how, how do you project that? Uh, and I, I'm not knocking the GMs. I was with Tannenbaum earlier, and I said, guys like you, you know, thought Dak Prescott was a fourth-round pick. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not a perfect science. And I, I think what we're talking about here is is why all the draft gurus, and, and they get paid a lot of money, and they study it more than I do or more than you do, uh, are, are like are like everyone else. They 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 they, they hit and miss. I mean, you, you don't want an airline pilot to hit and miss, mm-hmm. but a G, but a, but an NFL GM, if he gets something right, it's a big deal now. Dak Prescott to me is a top three league MVP Absolutely. candidate behind Lamar Jackson and of course Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes was out there um, in in Texas. Uh, you look at a uh, uh, you know a Dak Prescott. He was out there. He was in Southeastern Conference as well. Surprised at all with what you're seeing yeah, from I'm him? I'm shocked because I, I, Dak Prescott was a good quarterback. He, I mean, think about this next statement. He led Mississippi State for six or eight weeks to the number one spot in the poll. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were the number. They were the first, the first college football playoff poll. Mississippi State was number one, and that's a big deal. But it wasn't because he was a great quarterback. He was a good college quarterback, like Tebow, like others. But no one—I mean, absolutely no one—thought he he would translate to where where he is and what he is doing now. What do you think the biggest reason he's been able to make that transition? Is it coaching, or is it just the kind of man that he seems to be? Just the leadership, the composure, etc. That to me seems to stand out more than anything else. I'm not about to sit here next to you and give Jason Garrett too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that bait. No, no. Okay. I, I mean, I'm not an idiot. Um, I, I just think he matured. I think he was always smart. Uh, you know, he had a couple of off the field issues. Well, one that I think was much was made out of. I don't think it was a big deal at Mississippi State. But he had a good coach at Mississippi State in Dan Mullen, and I think he mm-hmm. prepared him for what he is currently doing. But but even then, uh, if you would have told me he 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 was he's an MVP possibility and about to make a hundred million dollars, I, I would have laughed you out. Coaching for a second, Cliff Kingsborough obviously has Texas Tech roots, uh, obviously had a relationship. Uh, I don't know whether it would be with Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, whatever the case may be. My attitude is very, very simple. When you were a college coach, you were five games under 500. Um, you didn't produce, you didn't win, and somehow, some way, that materializes into a head coaching job. I've never understood it. I don't understand it now. And I'm never going to root for somebody to fail because I certainly won't root for him and especially Kyler Murray to fail. But I do find myself looking at him and saying, why is he in that position? Where did you find it, yourself? It was a gimmick hire, uh, and I didn't like it. And, and, and you know, listen, <laughs> I don't understand a lot of these hires in, in the NFL, Stephen A., but uh, you know, you, you, I, I've never owned a team, and I, I, I'm never going to have to worry about it, unless I, unless you, in, unless you uh, inherit, and I, I inherit you, and you, you, you officially sign the adoption paper, so I can be your, I can be your first son. Right. But uh, I just think that they they go for trends, uh, and I, w- I wouldn't hire him. I wouldn't hire him to be a college coach. Mm. He was he was about to be the offensive coordinator. At USC, I mean that was about it. Uh, that that was I thought that was where he was going to end up, maybe with a shot at succeeding inter, on an interim basis. If Helton got fired, mm-hmm. uh, and next thing you know, he's he's got the first pick in the NFL draft. Unbelievable. We're talking to the great Paul Feinbaum right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. One more quarterback I want to get into uh, before I get to some college football stuff. Mason Rudolph <laughs> with Big Ben Roethlisberger out for the year due to his elbow injury. Mason Rudolph is the new. Head coach, I mean the head of the quarterback, uh, the new quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
This was a guy that was at Oklahoma State, relatively decent. Okay. But 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 he's a core, starting quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. How am I supposed to feel about this? I, I mean, I don't feel good about it at all. Now, I know it's, it sounds like we're saying the same thing about every quarterback. But, yeah, he was a good quarterback. Uh, I don't remember him ever – leading his team to a win over his big rival, Oklahoma. Maybe I missed one. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, I saw him. I, he, was, he was good. Uh, he was very good. But uh, in, in, there is no way uh, he is positioned to take over for Ben Roethlisberger. No. Two 4,000-yard seasons in the last two years at Oklahoma State. I'll give him that much. I don't know how he's going to do on this level. You could, you could be a 4,000-yard guy in the Big 12. Okay. All right. I got it. That is a good point. That is a good point. Talking to Paul Feinbaum right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. I want to transition to a more sensitive subject mm-hmm. because um, Friday, the, my friend, the one and only Tim Tebow, came on first take. And obviously he was responding to the California pay for play uh, rules that are scheduled for implementation. College athletes going to be able to profit off of their own name, get some marketing dollars, et cetera, et cetera. And Tim Tebow spoke out adamantly against that. Or uh, Basically, what I took from his position is that he's about amateurism, that he's about, you know, the purity of amateurism and what have you. He knows other people are getting paid and the student athletes are not. So what? He's a Heisman Trophy winner, national champion, had a number one selling jersey. He didn't get a dime. He didn't have a problem with it. He doesn't. He worries about the sanctity of the sport being compromised to some degree. I know you saw what he had to say on Friday. I know you saw the backlash that he received over social media over the weekend in the millions. I want to. I'm interested in knowing your response to all of that. I was with him uh, right after he did your your hit, and uh, I, I I was watching him. Uh, we were sitting on the bus uh, out in uh, Kentucky. And yeah, I think he was really stunned by, by the reaction. That's not really the question, though. Um, I'm also at a disadvantage here. Mm-hmm. I know him like you do. Yeah. I'm friends with him. And, I, and, and, when you, and what I mean by that is to know Tim Tebow is to know that he is genuine. Yes. He's just not saying something to say it. He Absolutely. really believes that. Absolutely. Now, he may be, uh, you and I both will very likely disagree with him. We do. But that's okay. Um, I thought... The reaction or the overreaction w- was very toxic, uh, and it was it was it w- there were a lot of people out there who disagree with his politics, who don't like his stands on everything. And I'm not going to sound like we're, a pol- we're we're politicians here that they're against somebody who, who's for religion because that's mm-hmm. absurd. Right. But they 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 finally had a chance to take him out, mm. and you saw it from a I mean on, on in the Twitter world and in, in our world. One after another uh, decided I'm I'm aiming and firing at Tim Tebow because I disagree with him. It, it got personal. It got it, it got toxic. Uh, I I think it was just so far over the top from a, for a guy that that really believes all this. I mean, yeah, he may come from an antiquated point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he he didn't grow up. He he grew up differently than I did and, gr- and differently than you did. But that doesn't mean he's wrong about what he believes. And and I, I just think Tim Tebow is still one of those athletes. I'm not about to say, oh, he, he got drummed out of the NFL because he's a Christian. I mean, right. I, come on. Right. I mean, no, he, he, I tell you, I'll be the first to say, because he couldn't throw. No. He couldn't throw, period. But, and he knows I say that all the time. But a lot of a lot of his followers believe this kind of stuff because they, they are true believers. But. Uh, it, it's it's a reaction that's not over yet. Uh, I think uh, you know. I don't know what Tim's next statement is going to be. I know you'll see him in, in well, two or three days. And, and I'll share. I'll share to you I'll, if you don't mind. I'll share with you exactly where I stand. I'm going to fight for him to the end on this. Yeah. I don't just. I don't agree with him. I think that his position is a bit antiquated. No question. I think that's an appropriate word to use. But I completely respect where he's coming from. Um, he's an individual that is a Heisman Trophy winner, a national champion. Oh, by the way, he had the number one selling jersey. Yeah. He did not sound oblivious to anything. Yeah. What he said was, I could have been that guy that you're describing and went for the money. I didn't care. That's perfectly within his right to take that position. He could have been somebody that felt like, you know what? Look at me. Look at what I bring to the sport. Let me get paid. Let me make my money. Now, again, I explained to Tim Tebow, 
if you're an African-American, somebody from an impoverished background and stuff like that, and you don't believe that the system favors you, that the system is going to do you any favors, that they're waiting there with their hands out to pull you in and give you an opportunity, then you're going to get what you can while you can get it, and you're going to push for those kind of policies to be implemented. I said, you, on the other hand, is beloved by a lot of people, and there's opportunities that are available to you so you could afford to feel differently. But again, I, while I disagree with his point, I knew he was genuine. I knew it didn't come from a place of malice. And for people to bring up race and to use that as an opportunity to attack him, I thought was incredibly egregious and unfair to him. Well, the line that, w- that was so predictable and so lazy and, and intellectually dishonest right. was for people to say you know, he's from privilege. Yes. And, and I understand that. I've been, I've been on, uh, I, I used to be where Tim is, and, and I got to know a lot of players right. uh, through my work at ESPN, and, and I do understand it now. Right. Uh, I, I didn't grow up with a lot, but I grew up with probably more than most mm-hmm. it, that are playing the game. Right. So I, I, I respect that. But, but Tim Tebow is, is just simply looking at it. Yeah, it's, he's looking at it for, through a very narrow prism, but it, it's the prism that he has lived. And this isn't a guy that's, that while he has made a lot of money right. uh, off endorsements, it's not like— Now, after he, yeah, after he, he stopped playing college football. But look what yeah. else he does. And you know it. I, I've been to his charity events countless yeah. times. This is a guy that goes to the Philippines. And gives back he, all he, the time. He never stops. Never stops. And he influences other people to do that. But I'm, I'm also not surprised, Stephen A. And by, I mean, I, I'm not trying to bring you into every conversation. Sure. I, but w- when something good happens to you— Everyone hates you. Everyone <laughs> wants to bring you down. Right. Tim Tebow is similar. You're, you come from different sides of, 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 of the spectrum, but but the but the hate and the jealousy is the same. Yeah. I would. My advice to Tim Tebow is suck it up and take it. It's it's it's, it's not going anywhere. No. It's going to keep going. You got to be like me a little bit. Tell them to kick rocks. It's not hard. <laughs> it's, it's it's almost cathartic to 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 literally well, look at the haters. The difference is, say, um, we all want to be liked to a degree. You know, you're not going to be. I don't think he understood that. I mean, right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not speaking out of school here, but I right. feel like I'm with him every weekend, and I, I think he really believes people like him and want to embrace him. And when, when all this hate started coming out, it surprised him. It surprised him and, and, and took him aback a little bit. But I thought it was grotesquely unfair to him. I'll just leave it at that. Paul Feinbaum right here with Stephen A., ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Before I let you get on out of here, be remiss in neglecting to get into some college football games. Notre Dame, Georgia. What's going to happen this weekend, man? Uh, Georgia is going to put a beating down on, on Brian Kelly. He, he can't win on the road. He, he hasn't done it since he's been there. He's a good coach. I'm not saying mm-hmm. he's not. Uh, I wouldn't want to play for him, mm-hmm. but that's beside the point. <laughs> Why not? What's wrong with Brian Kelly? I like Brian Kelly. I just don't. I, I just. I don't like the way he treats his players. Okay, uh, and I've heard that from people that have played. For I him. don't know how he treats his players, uh, so you would know. But, I don't know. But he's a good coach. I'd be okay. an idiot to say he's not a good coach. He's he's one. Of the, he's in the upper echelon of coaches, but he's going to a place and he's going to see a team I think is is on the same level as Alabama and Clemson. And uh, George is waiting for the, has been waiting for this opportunity. Mm-hmm. I, I think it'll be a double digit. When you game. say you don't like how he treats his players. Is he similar or, or, or worlds apart from the Nick Sabans, the Kirby Smarts of the world? I think Dabo Sweeney comes across as a very likable, yeah. affable kind of coach. I like Nick Saban. You know how I feel yeah. about Nick Saban, but I wouldn't call. I don't think other people view him the way I view him. Well, I think Nick Saban, well, even when he's when he's being hard on somebody, you know, it's for your for your own good. Right. Uh, there's a message to it. I, I, I've seen so, situations with Brian Kelly where I, I didn't understand it. Just right. it just came off course. Mm. We also have Michigan, Wisconsin, <laughs> noon Saturday. I can't wait to see this one because, to me, this is going to tell me a lot about Jim Harbaugh here. Yeah, l- listen, if, if Michigan loses this game, it, it's, it will be open season on Jim Harbaugh. That doesn't mean he's going to lose his job, but but the conversation is going to be ratcheted up. I mean, mm-hmm. right right now it's maybe DEFCON 7, even though there's no such thing. Right. It's going to be 3, 4, 5, uh, because he still has Notre Dame left. He he has Penn State, and, of course, he has Ohio State. But you lose this game, and, and suddenly the rest of those other games are like playing Russian roulette. Was it Auburn, Texas a Yeah, it's a good game. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's a game you'll find out whether Auburn uh, is going to contend or not. I mean, I, I'm They're 3-0. Not, yeah, I mean, they, they have a big win over or, Oregon. All right. They didn't know and how you felt about Justin Herbert so far. I still, even though they, you still no, like I, him? I still like him. But uh, but again, that, that that tanking for two, I think, is another day and another That's conversation. Right. You still feel good about this kid feels at Ohio State, correct? I really I really like him. 
Yeah, you like them a lot, right? And, and right now, I, I think I think Clemson could beat the Dolphins. <laughs> that ain't saying much I didn't right think now. It was saying I a mean, lot. it's pretty damn bad the way that it is right now, Paul. No question about. It. Before I let you get on out of here, I'm a fan of Jimbo Fisher as well. I liked him when he was at Florida State. He's at Texas A&M right now. I mean, I'm just looking at them. They're two and one on the season. Just beat Lamar non-major to sixty-two to three. But lost to Clemson, got pretty smacked around considering the way they some of their players was talking smack. How are you feeling about the job Jimbo Fisher's doing at Texas A&M? How are you feeling about them as a program right I'm, now? I'm not a patient guy, but I still think it's a little early. And and next year won't be early. Uh, he's recruiting really well, but Stephen A., uh, schedule schedule conversation can be, can be overdone. But his schedule this year is is going to make him look bad until next year. I mean by this. He's already lost to Clemson. Mm -hmm. He has Alabama. He has Georgia. And he has LSU. You want to figure out, you know, you know, all all of those those are the top four teams in the country. I got here's where I'm thinking, Paul. I went down to Texas A&M a couple of times, obviously. It's a it's immaculate campus. The facilities are off the charts. I'm just looking at the money behind this program. They gave him 75 million now. Uh, I'm just looking at their facilities, everything. That to me, when you have that kind of support, even though you're in the SEC, there is just no excuse to me not to be one of the elite teams in the country. Am I wrong for feeling yeah, no, that No, you're, you're right. The problem is, is the road he's on is cluttered. Yeah. And, and he, he's got to knock somebody off eventually. And, you know, you can't live on losing to Clemson last year by two points. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, can he beat Alabama at home? That that may be his opportunity. That game is at home. The rest of them are on the road. He's not going to win at, at LSU. He's not going to win at Georgia, and he didn't win at Clemson. Listen, so. when I look at Georgia, for example, under Mark Rick, they're not what they are under no. Kirby Smart. No. They're clearly better. They could have won a national championship if it wasn't exactly. for Tua's heroics exactly. a couple of years ago. We get all that. Kirby Smart rolls up in there. It's a different ball game. How come it couldn't have been a different ball game at Texas A&M it, with, it, with, 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 you know, uh, Jimbo Fisher? I, I, I agree. Um, I'm, I'm making, I, you know, I don't make excuses for coaches. I, I think if, if he can settle down, I mean, if he if he goes eight and four, Stephen A. with that with that schedule, even it's not that bad. He's just basically lost to the top four teams in the country. Mm-hmm. But that won't work next year. Mm. I mean, he's got a bunch of oil fat cats slapping him on the back. They're they're not going to say, hey, good, good game. Hate hate you lost to Bama by three touchdowns. They are going to start wanting victories, and that's going to come next year. And the one other thing about Jimbo that is negative is. There's still a tug of war on how much of the problem at FSU right now is Willie Taggart. I think it's a lot. Yes. And how mu- how bad was that program that he inherited? I understand that, but Jimbo Fisher never had them looking as bad as they've looked under Taggart, no. though. I mean, five Florida years State. ago, they were the number one team in the Absolutely. country coming off a national championship. Absolutely. And by the way, speaking of Jimbo Fisher, going back to Jim Harbaugh, I don't think Jimbo Fisher nor Jim Harbaugh are going anywhere. But I do believe it's going to come a point in time where we're going to just look at them as just another team I agree. as opposed to elite programs. Totally. I think totally that's to say, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, Jimbo's on the clock next year. Yeah, no question. Paul Feinbaum, always appreciate you, buddy. Thank Thanks you so much. The best. The one and only Paul Feinbaum right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. 888-SAY-ESPN is the number to call up. This 888-729-3776. Back to your phone calls in just a minute. Don't touch that dial. You're listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. By the way, when it comes to hiring, you don't have time to waste. You know that, right? Sam, Sam Donald's got mononucleosis. Ladies and gentlemen, folks joked around and talked about, you know, that's the kissing disease or whatever. Y'all have any idea how serious that is? It's not a laughing matter. Kidneys and liver supposedly get enlarged. There are people, if I'm correct, who have died from mononucleosis. This is not a joke. On this show. We wish nothing but the best for Sam Donald. A speedy recovery, 100% health, so he can get on the field and remind us what a quarterback that he is. So I can understand if you're the New York Jets, knowing and anticipating that eventually he'll be back this season, why you might not want Colin Kaepernick in your stable. But if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers, what excuse is there? Ben Roethlisberger's gone for the year. Are you really going to sit there with a straight face and tell me that Mason Rudolph is your answer? Oh, by the way, are you going to tell me after watching Lamar Jackson run for over 100 yards and pass for over 250 yards that 
it doesn't give you some kind of indication of what Colin Kaepernick might potentially be capable of doing for you, even though he's been out of the game for a few years? Does he not deserve a tryout? I'd say he does. I wouldn't mind seeing Colin Kaepernick with a tryout. Mistakes notwithstanding, no matter what you believe, I'm going to repeat, man didn't break no laws. Man didn't even break NFL bylaws. What's wrong with giving him a look? See, if you can't give him a look under these situations, then it is official that he has been blackballed. It is official. Because there ain't no reason to not give him a look. You can at least give the man a look. Give him a tryout. See what he's got. Now, in defense of those teams, I will say this. Colin Kaepernick, you want a job in the National Football League? Going on Twitter, showing video of you throwing passes to Odell Beckham Jr. Don't get you an NFL job. Your agent needs to be down, uh, and I'm not saying the agent is not doing this, but the agent needs to be out there pounding the pavement and convincing the team to give you a look. The Jets are a bad football team. This was a banged up Jets team. And we just found a way to win. Let's be honest. This game was what it was. The Jets are down to their third string quarterback. They're not going to win this game. They also lost their quarterback, Trevor Simeon. I guess these are teachable moments, but right now it's going to add up to a losing moment. We'll take the W's however they're going to come. OBJ comes back to MetLife and does this 89-yard touchdown. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Radio ESPN News. Thanks again to the great Paul Feinbaum for coming on with us, talking with us for the full first segment of our number two. Great insight on his part, as always, of course. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio, which is presented by Progressive Insurance, small business protection for more than vehicles with specialized coverages to protect against financial loss. More at ProgressiveCommercial.com. Also, from the biggest concerts and games to the hottest theater shows and more, Vivid Seats has it all. Download the app and join the Vivid Seats Rewards Loyalty program today back to the phones we go 888 say espn let's go to matt you're live with Stephen a talk to me matt how you doing hey Stephen a how's it going i'm all right talk to me i'm just reviewing your comments on the daniel jones trade and um the actions of dave gettleman with odell beckham trading him uh for literally nothing a downgrade from landon collins uh just looking at the moves that he's made uh landon collins like i said just not getting anything for him just let him go to division rival for basically nothing um not really focusing on the needs of the team you know i like the fact that he got three first round picks but just like i said with the beckham trade not building up for the future you know giving up future giving us future assets assets uh, Mm -hmm. for the team uh, to compete in future years. Well, listen, here's the bottom line. When you look at, when you look at um, the New York giants and the decisions that they've elected to make, I don't think the, the moving of Odell Beckham jr. Was a football move. I think it was a culture move. I think that the New York giants were making the point that there's a certain kind of player that they wanted here and they didn't want to be involved. They didn't want to be involved with anything. And that was the unfortunate part in all of this. I think Odell Beckham Jr. was moved because they didn't want him influencing Saquon Barkley, uh, his temperamental tendencies and things of that nature. I do not believe they were right. I do believe they should have held on to Odell Beckham Jr. Make no mistake about that. I think it's a huge mistake that they let him go. A couple of other things, you you know, listen, what what are you going to say? Jabril Peppers and Kevin Zeitler and a 2019 first-round pick and a third-round pick for Odell Beckham Jr. and Olivia Vernon is basically what it came down to last March. Uh, But I just look at it. Listen, they moved in a forward direction. Even with Odell Beckham Jr., this roster has so many problems. I just don't know how viable that would have been for anybody. And I think that's what this all comes down to. All right, Stephen A. Um, Just one more thing. Um, Gettleman, I know you're big on Gettleman. I know you're- no, you don't know I'm big on Gettleman. That is absolutely patently false. I'm kind of wondering whether or not you listen to this show. I'm not big on Gettleman at all. 
I know that's what I meant, Stephen A. But um, I know you're not big on Gettleman. Um, I think looking at the candidate search for the GM, I really think I've been telling my friends this. I really think they should hire Lewis, your own, your good friend Lewis Riddick. Uh, yes, Lewis yeah, Riddick, Lewis Riddick, in my opinion, should have had the GM job for the New York Giants ahead of Gettleman. Gettleman had it because he had a previous relationship with ownership because he used to be in pro uh, in, in personnel, um, and I think that the relationships are ultimately what got him that job, which is why it's so important important that uh, the NFL is inclusionary in terms of, you know, giving people access to the same folks and what have you, because people are too busy hiring their friends as a po- and people that they're comfortable with as opposed to the best candidates for the job. I think that's something that's incredibly uh, disconcerting. You look at uh, Matt LaFleur from the Tennessee Titans. This dude failed up. He had the 27th ranked offense as offensive coordinator in Tennessee. He's the 10th candidate for the Green Bay Packers job, and they, and, and they give him the job. You look at uh, Cliff Kingsbury. He failed in college. He didn't win at Texas Tech. But somehow, some way, because of supposed relationships with some quarterbacks, he has a head coaching NFL job. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. So it's a problem. It really is. But I got to go. I appreciate the call. Thank you so much. Let's go to Nick. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Nick? Talk to me. Hey, uh, Stephen A. How you doing? I'm all right. Go ahead. Uh, Do you agree that the hits by Miles Garrett on Trevor Simeon, Trevor Simeon were in fact roughing the passer. I don't know. I got to go back and see it again. I didn't view it that way at, in, in real time. I didn't watch the replays or anything like that. I was multitasking, but I didn't view it that way in real time. I thought it seemed to be a legitimate hit. And not only that, you're going to get at the quarterback any chance you get. That's what happens. And it wasn't like the guy was concussed or anything like that. His ankle was hurt. You know, so you look, yeah, yeah. He's, I just saw it again. He slammed him to the ground. Uh, you could sit up there and say it might have been rough in the passer because he made sure to put him to the ground and landed on him as opposed to just hitting him. Uh, you could make that legitimate argument, but that's still a football play. And I don't have a problem with it. I understand. All right. Thank you so much. Take it easy. Let's go to Dale. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Dale? Yeah, I was just wanting to talk to you about this college pay for play. Okay, go ahead. Do you, do you think we're opening up a can of worms that could actually destroy this program? Uh, because one well, high school senior is going to get the first million out of this. Well, here's my question to you. Do you believe in America? I believe. All right. Do you, believe, do you believe in a capitalistic society? Just stay yes, with me. Just stay with me for a second. The reason I'm asking you that question is that do you have children, sir? Oh, yeah. Okay. So when you raise your children, you want them to be the best that they can be, right? Yes. You want them to put in that hard work, right? Yes. Now, what if they said everybody deserves the same? How would you feel about that? Everybody deserves it. I'm saying, what? How would you feel about the notion that everyone deserves the same, no matter what? So if your kid works twice as hard and is twice as productive. But does it end? But but ends up being compensated in an equitable fashion to everybody else. Is that an issue for you? Um, depends on the situation. Okay, it really does. Uh, to get a college education to make everything equitable in the program. But um, what are you going to have left when you have the UCLA's, the Ohio State, the Kentucky's, the Dukes? I would would make the argument what you have now. For example, you have the big five conferences negotiating these exorbitant television deals. Drexel and and, and Villanova and some of these Division I AA schools and what have you, they don't have that going for them. There's clearly, there's an exorbitant amount of dollars that are available for the bigger schools. All right, the more renowned programs than it is for the smaller, less renowned programs. Nobody's complaining now. Why is it a complaint only when the kids are talking about being compensated in a fashion that the institutions are talking about being compensated? Okay. All right. That's uh, what I'm trying to find out. Uh, You know, who's going to make the money and who ain't going to make the money? Well, again, the the people that's going to make the money are the ones who generate revenue. And the people who ain't going to make the money are the ones who don't. Last time I checked, that's the American way. 
I don't have a problem with it. Again, we're not talking about actual salaries, but we're talking about a level of compensation where if you're at a big-time program and everybody around you is collecting some dough off of your exploits, you probably deserve a piece of the action in some capacity. Maybe don't bother you when you get treated to an airline ticket home to see your family on Christmas. Maybe leave you alone if, you know what, you got an apartment as opposed to somebody else who might have a dorm room. Maybe don't sweat that stuff. And we're not having this discussion as opposed to nitpicking and trying to limit what people ultimately get because their exploits demand it while you sit up there and try to treat everybody as if they're equal when in fact they're actually not. Well, Think yeah, of, I understand that. But right? what are you going to tell these other programs now? I just told are, you, sir. Uh, well, I just told you. T- well, let's say the, you got a, uh, you got one of the classy uh, football programs like Ohio State, Alabama. Yeah. And you know that they're, uh, let's say they're tennis teams. They got to be compensated. Uh, they don't have to be compensated. Teams. They don't. They don't. If I'm playing New Mexico State, be happy with your damn scholarship. Because you ain't us. You mean Ohio, I mean Alabama and those teams, they just go ahead and quit the other uh, programs sir, because sir. everything's going towards football, basketball. I got, I, I, sir, that's life. I got to go. I appreciate the call. That is life, ladies and gentlemen. It's life. Uh, oh, so what he's talking about, y'all, is this. Excuse me. It's not fair that football and basketball are going to make the money, but wrestling and volleyball and all of this other stuff ain't. Yes, it is. If you don't generate money any other sports do, then that's how it goes. It's just like people out there, J.C. John, when we argue that police officers and firefighters are the most valuable people in our society and doctors and things of that nature, they deserve a lot of money. They ain't getting paid what Odell Beckham Jr. is getting paid. They ain't getting paid what Julio Jones or Michael Thomas or Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or somebody is getting paid. They ain't getting paid what Big Ben Roethlisberger, Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott's about to be paid. They ain't getting paid that. You know why? Because we appreciate you. And we value you. But that doesn't create revenue. And because it doesn't create revenue, you don't get to get what those other dudes get. It's the American way. We've understood it for centuries. Why are we acting like we don't know now? Back with your calls to close out the show in a minute. Your radio. It's unnecessary and it's uncalled for. I want to reemphasize. I don't dis- I don't agree with Tim Tebow's position totally. But he made a profoundly strong argument on his own behalf, not to mention the fact that I thought it came from the right place. I just disagree with him. Because one of the things, and I want my white producers to look at me when I'm saying this. Because as black folks, as minorities in this country, we need to address something that's very, very important. I think I've been working with Jonathan Winthrop for a long time. I've gotten to know my man, JC, for many years and other producers here and what have you. And folks that work within this country, we've got some black folks here, we've got some white folks here. I don't believe that you're a bad person because you disagree with me. Oh, by the way, let me take it a step further. I would totally understand if they don't. I would totally understand if they can't relate to my black experience. You know why? Because they're not black. This notion that everybody has to understand where we come from without being us, to me, is ill-informed. I said the same thing to y'all about the Kaepernick situation. I said the same thing to y'all about Jerry Jones when he was taking a position on the knee and all of this other stuff and everybody was going up. I said, excuse me, I don't expect a white billionaire to have the same sensitivities, culturally or otherwise, than impoverished people from the minority community. That's not them. It's not who they are. Our objective should be identifying what our goals, what our agenda is, 
and going about the business of convincing them that it's in the best interest of their agendas to facilitate progress when it comes to us. Period. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. If you missed any of today's show, go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith Podcast. Brought to you by the Capital One Quicksilver card. Earning unlimited 1.5% cash back on every purchase, everywhere. Hey, hey, what's in your wallet? Ray, you're live with Stephen A. Real quick, Ray, go. Hey, what's happening, Stephen A.? All right, go ahead. I would like to make two quick points. First of all, thank you for saying last week on First Take, especially to the young ones out there on the come up, do not replicate what Antonio Brown did by breaking every man code out there just to get his way because 99% of you will not have your way. That was so true, Stephen A. Yep. Secondly, real quickly, respect Molly on First Take, totally, but you should have a First Take primetime show featuring you and Molly debating all kinds of interesting topics going head-to-head, Stephen A., because I will put all my money on you and have Max or Will Kane as the moderator, especially after the comments she made last week when you guys were at the U.S. Open in Queens with Chris Everett, Ever Lloyd, and John McEnroe. And you said that you are always right when you debate, and she right away said, well, that's because I don't debate. Meaning if she did debate it, she would win. Stephen my, A., my man, please she was, make this happen. She was please. only playing. She knows. She knows better. I love Molly. Love her to death. But she knows better. Most people can't debate against me. I'm not bragging. I'm just giving you facts, bro. You know, as it pertains to my own plan, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Never know what's coming down the pike. Randy, I'm sorry, but you only got like 30 seconds. Go. I'll make it super quick. I am a capitalist from the word go. I totally understand what you're saying in regards to paying college athletes. I do think it'd be a major slippery slope because if you're going to pay the football players and the basketball players, but not the volleyball players and the lacrosse players, the next step is going to be the quarterback's going to want more money than the punter, and the star forward is going to want more money than the guy that's riding the pine on a basketball team, and it's a slippery slope. And quite I, honestly, I don't think. I agree with you, but my point is, is that, you know, come to me when the administrators, the football coaches and people like that stop getting extra money on the side. Talk, call them to me when they learn how to do without. Then you could tell the student athlete to do without, who's a revenue generator. But we could talk about that tomorrow. Call back, buddy, and we'll talk about it further. I'm about to sign up, but I'll be back in 22 hours. Until then, peace and love.